by your princess Ilka. She's back here. <laughs> you want to know? She's back there. Cha cha, I'm your sweet, generous, kind, intelligent Princess Zilke. <laughs> Too fast? Not so fast. Okay. Cha cha, I am your sweet Princess Zilke. I'm generous, kind, and I'm sharing. I am intelligent. And you want to know about Heike? Okay, Heike too went to live into a gated community, but that wasn't fancy. That was just simple houses, and it was very, very, very large. And that was like the time where in Cornavaca, maybe in many cities, but in Cornavaca, people were just clothing the street. Another colored gated community. They could last a few blocks, a few of those. Yeah, Elisa too lived in one of them. <laughs> but Heike lived, that was not fancy at all. But before that, she lived in a house just like the same, not really fancy. But they are good sized houses and with, with large gardens. They're all in the south. I never lived in the south. See, when I look into the Milagros Mom story and Heike, I have a sense of solidarity with Heike. But not with that Argentinian woman. But yes, with Luis's sister. Who is also Argentinian. There's a different attitude in life. That's just a feeling. Heike came from East Germany. And she still lived in the... Before the wall opened, before the borders opened. She still lived that. She told me herself. We lived in apartment buildings, she said. And be like, we all knew each other and we were all solidarity, solidarity with each other. Helping each other. Your children's playing down and it's like a community. Because we're just human beings living in the same place. We're just in this country or in this earth. That's what I mean by same place. That is the attitude of, of East, of communism. And Heike was always like at the brink of a nervous breakdown. I don't know, maybe capitalism was too hard for her. No, she was young. No, she was pregnant and then she bore a son. Married to Luis, the Argentinian, who had to exit Argentina because of the economic crash. Him, like many others, to find alternatives and opened an Argentinian restaurant, which was cute, it looked like a Mexican beach place. Simple. It was not very successful because he had no clue about marketing. It was not successful because I heard it from her. She said that on Mondays he was really worried because no one would come in to the restaurant. About money, of course. He did not know about marketing because there were already two Argentinian restaurants in Cuernavaca. One was like super famous and super cool and awesome, super well located. And his wasn't very far away from that position. But in some back street behind, no one could see it. I'm pretty damn sure he did not make any publicity either. And you don't need that in Mexico if, if you have something to offer. I remember I went once with Pabarotti all the way to the super, super south of Cuernavaca just to eat in a tiny little insignificant place, almost yeah, an outdoors we ate. Mariscos. Seafood. Because someone said it's good and fresh. 
That's Mexico. They recommend stuff because it's good. We're talking food here. But he missed out on that part. He didn't know. He just had arrived. So there was no reason or purpose for anybody to go to his restaurant if we had the other one, which was so nice. And then there was another one, a newer one, which looked like an American fast food place in my world or, old, or an American old fart restaurant with booths. I went once in. I, th I don't think we ordered. I think we went by Varotin. I said it was empty. It was austere. It was boring. Then we said, let's go. Yeah, let's go. Bam, out. I only saw it because it was in a tiny mall in the very entrance. Oh, that was a good location, by the way. In front of one of my favorite taco places. Get the notion. So they were worried about money. And then Heike was too innocent. She did not allow to help. No one, she was not allowing anybody to help her with anything. That is the issue. She lived in a house, which was, yeah, whatever, regular. To me, it was all ugly because she had no style. But she lived in, an, in a T-shape. So her head would point down to a street, which would drive right into her house if they wouldn't hit the brake. That is bad feng shui that you can see, anybody can will see it. If you think that potentially a car might actually drive into your house and your wall where you have your head in your bedroom, it's not a good place to sleep. She couldn't sleep, she told me herself. So I started telling her. So she moved out. Not because I told her, she was already like, yeah, um, Jean and Marc. She was a Stella. She couldn't handle anymore. So she told me she was looking for another house. And I, I told her, don't, don't even ask. Just let me have a peek before you actually go and rent it. The renters, they couldn't afford to buy. Let me have a peek so I can help you out. No, I would have done that for free. Having a peek, doesn't matter. You see, that's solidarity. Money, if you have, go ahead, pay because I need it. If you don't, doesn't matter, I give it to you. It doesn't matter. Important is that it's done. That is the attitude I have. Oh, she did something else. I met her at El Lamas, of course. I have no clue why I went, probably to meet her. Because I had already been to one the first time. And that was a good one. But this was kind of, ugh, it was not a good one. I told you the story. That's the hiker story. So in La Mas, you talk, right? You talk about and you get you get the notion what to do and what not to do. And pro basically La Mas is to protect women from abusive doctors. And Heike had one of those abusive doctors. The abusive doctor took Heike's innocence and took an x-ray. You shouldn't take an x-ray when you're pregnant, by the way. Therefore, we invented ultrasound, not x-ray. But he did it. And he showed her, look, the baby is this large and your vagina is this small. You can clearly see your baby in your head doesn't fit through your vagina. You need a C-section. Can you believe such a nonsense? Nonsense. Re ever heard of dilatation? One, two, three, up to ten. It opens up for childbirth. Yeah, ever since, man. Ever since. The nature has it done like that. That, yeah, all mammals can birth without doctors. Get it? So she comes back to Lamas and tells us the story. And the director of the Lamas, the woman, the guiding woman, she yells out, screams out, oh my goodness, abusive. Yeah, fuck all, sucking. He wants to sell you a C-section woman. Because, first and foremost, that's much more expensive than just a natural birth. Second, he doesn't have to handle and deal your birth. Because it could take anything up to, I don't know, 48 hours, maybe not, but just about. And he has to sit there with you. C-section? No. Get an appointment, date, open, grab the baby, close, done. Don't go for it, it's a trick. And doctors have been pulling that out for a very long time. And guess what? Heike didn't listen to her. To none of the women saying, come on, Heike. The doctor was the director of a hospital. Not the famous one. 
which was, we called it Hotel Cuernavaca because it was so pretty. I think it was called Hospital, Hosp Cuernavaca Hospital. Another one in the entrance. And he literally sold her a C-section because Heike was so obedient and used to just follow the instructions of the authority from her East German upbringing that she did not trust it, the Lama woman or anybody sitting there and went with the doctor. Once a C-section, you always need a C-section. Opening your tummy, get the baby out, close it back up, it's outrageous. There were no need. And how much money did cost? Did that cost Heike? There's no insurance. By the way, <laughs> I gave birth in that house, in that in that um, hotel. No, that was I gave birth in the first one, the first child, and in the second that where Heike got the C-section. The director of the hospital, I gave birth there too, because it was cheaper. So I asked if I could do it like La Masse style with Bach music in my room and candle lights and all very romantic. And he said, no, you cannot give birth in your room. You have to go to the delivery room. Okay, guess what? Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> I arrived, no, I had envisioned. The first one was so hard, I died the first childbirth. I literally died on the table there. It was so hard that I kind of had to, I was completely traumatized the second time. So I had to do something. And I saw somewhere a two hour childbirth in some magazine or so. I said, oh, that's cool, I want it. Two hour. Because the previous one, I had passed seven hours in transition. Okay, so when you start to have contractions, first they're like uh, spaced, sporadic, and then they come closer and closer. And 15 minutes before birth, you got a very, very intense face. Like the last contractions were just super painful, but that's the one who pushes the child out. I had these 15 minutes for seven hours without pause. To the extent that when I arrived at the hospital, I was so exhausted, I could barely breathe. And then, I literally died for a moment on, on the table. I didn't know why it was. But everything I didn't want it, I had learned Lama, so he did that, the doctor. He totally violated me, brutalized me. I wanted everything natural and he violated everything around me. No, I'm listening. If I have to continue the story, I go back to Hagina. Okay, we do that another time. Go back to Heike. Oh no, go back to the birth, the second one. So in that hospital, so I arrived. And now I had visualized the secret, right? Visualized your, your reality. I had visualized it to our birth. So when the second child was coming, well, when the water broke in my house, I called the doctor. She, no, of course I changed the doctor. She said, oh, okay, meet you at that time. I was super cool. I took a shower, like as instructed. No, of course, seating. I had a chair in the shower, just in case. And I went to the hospital. Yeah, and that was like, the doctor was exhausted because he had just passed through a 20-hour labor. She was very tired, but I had a doula. I don't know why, maybe just to say the story, completely useless, an American too, and also not very sympathetic. Now Lita was cute, the, the first one from La Masse. She wasn't even the La Masse instructor. So the doula was sitting with me in the room and yes, I had Bach music on and candle lights and all that. And contractions came, so I did the entire choreography, you know, walking, sitting, standing, maybe dark position. Yeah, because it hurts. And then I said, the child is coming. And usually when you feel that, they tell you, don't push, because it still has to, you know, stuff has to happen. Kind of the doctor has to tell you when. Don't push. But I said, it's coming. <laughs> So the doula didn't know what to do. The doula opened the door, yelled the doctor's name, 
to, to come, to come, because, you know, I didn't, hadn't even put out my underwear yet to give birth. I kind of scratched it off my body, and Esther Dula was standing in the door, like halfway, like indoors and halfway outside, calling the doctor. Sophia was flutched out of me. She literally flutched out of me. Two hour birth. Ten cabron. <laughs> Fuck you, doctor. No delivery room, just in my room, just as they had asked. <laughs> no one had time to actually pass me onto anything else. So when the doctor came, the baby was already outside. Must have been an angel by my side Something heavenly led me to you Look at the sky